take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. scripture reading, so I'd like to do that today, and I want you to take your Bibles and open to Matthew 13 and stand together as we honor the Word of God and reading scripture, and I just want to read verses 1 down to verse 12 for our scripture reading this morning. If you would just follow along, and then we'll have a word of prayer and get into the message. Matthew 13, verse 1. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. And some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprang up, because they had no depthness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, and some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and he said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them... It is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. And therefore speak I unto them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not understand. Perceive. Can you bow with me together in prayer? This is God's holy word. May we submit to it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your precious word. That it is, We have an inspired and errant word of God. And Lord, we've come today to hear from you. We were reminded in the scripture that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Lord, help me, your servant today, to make your word clear. Because we know the power is in the message. So, Lord, may no one leave here today without understanding. May they receive your word. May they receive it not just superficially, but may they receive it in the depth of their being. And may that word, that powerful word, change who they are, who we are. May we be conformed more to the image of Christ. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Let me ask you a question. Why don't we see better results from the preaching of the gospel? You ever wonder that? I mean, I certainly do. Why don't we see more people getting saved? I'm talking about in in general, as a whole, in our country, when the word is being preached, when the gospel is being preached, why are so many people not responding to the message of the gospel? Why would anyone reject the gospel? Why would anyone reject the message of salvation? And I think there are many people that are asking these questions. I think perhaps this question has entered into your mind. There's been several times after a sermon, I'm standing in the back and some people come through and they say, Preacher, how anyone can be here and 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 leave saved, I'll never know. And yet there are people that come and they get under the gospel and yet they don't respond. Why is that? And I think the disciples were wondering the same thing. I mean, Jesus preached the gospel all through his ministry. I mean, you read, you read Matthew, you read Mark, you read any of the Gospels, you'll find out he went out all over preaching the kingdom is at hand. He preached the Gospel. And I would dare say, I would venture to say that perhaps there was no more powerful preacher than Jesus. Would you agree with me? I think perhaps there was no one who made the message of the kingdom any more clear than Jesus. Any more powerful than Jesus. And yet, there were people that didn't respond. There were people that rejected there were people that walked away. 
one of the, and Jesus was constantly inviting people. In fact, one of the greatest invitations is in Matthew 11, where Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And yet that passage really ended one phase of Jesus' ministry and another phase began. You say, why is that? Well, because that was in Matthew 11. In Matthew chapter 12, we have the episode of the religious leaders who basically hated Jesus, and their hatred came to a, a, uh, a climax. And you remember in Matthew chapter 12 that they accused Jesus of doing miracles in the power of Satan. There was no greater insult to Jesus and his ministry than to say that he was not from God, but that the exact opposite, he was ministering in the kingdom of darkness. And what you'll notice is that from that point on, in the ministry of Jesus, the whole tone and methodology, we could say, of his preaching and of his ministry, it all changed from that point on. From previous to that, Jesus was out there in, in the multitudes. He was preaching. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was very clear. But when that happened in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus began speaking in parables. This is a new thing for, uh, for him in this part of his ministry. And some of the disciples were wondering about that. Why are you speaking now in parables? Look in verse 10 of chapter 13. The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Jesus, why are you now changing the manner of your speaking? Why are you now speaking in parables? By the way, what are parables? Parable comes from two Greek words, para, which means alongside, balo, to cast, to cast down alongside. It's the idea of casting down alongside something unknown, something that is known. You cast the known down alongside the unknown so that the known will help the unknown to be known. Make sense? He would just take a basic earthly story and illustration he would cast it down alongside a spiritual truth so that you can make the mental connection, so that you can understand the spiritual truth that Jesus was talking about. Very simply put, one person said there are earthly sayings with heavenly meanings, but they teach really deep spiritual truth. And so why did Jesus begin at that point to speak in parables? Well, first of all, it was a form of judgment. This was a form of judgment. Sometimes people say, why don't you say more stories? Look, if you hear me... Saying more stories when I'm up here, it might be a form of judgment for you. That's what Jesus was doing. They say, why, why are you doing parables? Well, look at, look at verse 1. We'll kind of understand. On the same day went Jesus out of the house. What same day? The same day that he was accused of casting out demons and the power or doing miracles in the power of Satan. The same day that the... They came and said, we want a sign to show that you're legitimate. The same day that his family thought he was crazy and they wanted to kind of take him aside. That very same day, it says he went out of the house. What house was that? That was in Capernaum. That was the house of Peter. Capernaum is where he had his earthly ministry based at that moment. But he went out of the house, sat by the seaside. And there at Capernaum, right, it's right there on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. In fact, archaeologists have found that house, the house of Peter, where Jesus stayed, right next to the water. And it says in verse 2, And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Why did Jesus do that? And if you could just picture this in your mind, here's a great company of people on the shore. Here's Jesus in a boat just off of the shore. And he's kind of using this boat as a pulpit, so to speak. And I think there could be some... Uh, Something in that maybe perhaps he could be heard. His voice may be echoing off the water so that that multitude could hear him better. Perhaps that's happening here. But he's speaking to them, and now he speaks in parables. In verse 3, and he spake many things unto them in parables. Again, uh, the disciples were wondering, why are you doing this? And Jesus answered, look at verse 11, they asked him, he answered, and he said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even what he has. And basically Jesus was saying, I will not continue to reveal truth to people who have rejected what, life they, what light they've already been given. 
That's the idea there. Why are you speaking in parables, Jesus? Well, because those who have rejected truth, they're not going to understand what I'm saying now from here on out. To you who have received the truth, you'll get it, you'll understand, you'll have enlightenment, but for, for those who hear me, who have already rejected the truth, they're not going to get it. And I'm not going to continue to reveal light to those who have rejected it. That's what he's saying in verse number 12. It's the old principle, if you don't use it, you lose it. You know, some people wonder, why don't I understand the Bible better? Well, what, are you applying what you already know? Are you really uh, applying and adding to your life what he's already given you? Have you received fully everything he's already taught you? Because if you don't, chances are he's not going to give you any more. Whosoever hath, these are the people that already receive the truth about Jesus. They believe on him. They are receiving his words. Jesus said to those, to him it shall be given. That is, I'm going to add more to you. If you've received the truth and you're applying the truth, then I'm going to give you more. But then he said in verse 12, but whosoever hath not, who's that? Those are they who have not re received Jesus. They have rejected the light. They've rejected the truth. They saw him perform many miracles. They saw his signs. They heard his words, and they did not believe. They were exposed to God's incarnate son, and yet they rejected him. And so they don't have it. And he, he says, from them it shall be taken away. You see, friend, if, if you've been given light and you haven't received that light, God's going to, not only will he not give you more light, he'll take away whatever light you have. And you'll be subject to darkness. And so really the principle is you're either progressing spiritually or you are regressing spiritually, but you don't stand still. You're either getting more light or you're not, or you're getting less. That's what he's saying. And Jesus says, look at verse 13, Therefore I speak I unto them in parables, because they seeing see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand They'll see, but they don't see. They really won't get it. They'll hear, but they really won't understand because they haven't received the truth that they've already received. And then Jesus gives a prophecy. Look at verse 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. In other words, this was all prophesied in the Old Testament, in the ministry of Isaiah, that part of the ministry of the Messiah would be like this, that he would speak in parables to those people who have already received light, and yet they've rejected that light. And for those who have truly received the light, they're going to get more. And so this is really not only is it a form of judgment for some, it's a form of instruction for others. Because those who have received the truth, and if you have received the light, you know what's happening. He's giving you more light. He's giving you more truth. He's saying you're going to get it. And what Jesus is doing here in these parables is he's reminding the disciples of how the kingdom is going to advance. When we talk about the kingdom of God here, we're talking about that spiritual internal kingdom, that period between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. How is the kingdom of God expanding now? It's expanding spiritually. It's expanding inwardly in the hearts of men who receive Jesus Christ and who bow to his lordship. Jesus said to those, I'm going to reveal more about the kingdom to you and to those who have not, you're not going to get it. But look at verse 16. But blessed are you, or your eyes, for they see, and for your ears, for they hear. And so the disciples are privileged to hear what's going to happen, what's going to take place in the church age, what's going to take place in the kingdom. And by the way, so are you. We're privileged to hear all this in the word of God. But really, what Jesus is saying here is, look, this is what you must expect. Again, the disciples were wondering, why are not more people coming into the kingdom? When, the, when Jesus started out, it started out very small. Uh, there was 120 in the upper room. Now, later on, 3,000 got saved, and the kingdom of God has continued to expand. But basically, in Jesus' day and in his ministry, it started out small. You say, wait a minute, there were thousands that followed him. Yeah, they were following him because they wanted a miracle. They wanted a free meal. They wanted bagels for breakfast. 
But they weren't following him because they really believed. When you get down to that, that was a smaller group. And so the disciples are wondering, how is this all going to happen, Jesus? How is the kingdom going to expand? Why are there not more people responding? How come more people aren't getting saved? And so he gives this parable. Now, let me give you the first thing, the information. Look in verse number three, the information of the parable. He spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and he sowed some seed, and some seeds fell among by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. And some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no depth of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. And other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirtyfold. Now this would have been very familiar to the hearers of this, because back in Palestine it was not unusual to see a farmer spreading his seed. And he did it differently back then than we do today. He normally had a canvas sack along his side, and he would reach into that sack, and he would go into the field, and he would just begin to very uh, indiscriminately sprinkle these seeds all over. Very generous. He would reach in, and he would throw the seed out. And as he was doing this, there were the seeds landed in different places. First of all, there was the wayside soil in verse number 4. This was the hard-packed dirt of the road bordering the field. So picture this in your mind. When you look at the fields of Palestine, they weren't bordered by a fence. Normally, it was just a hard path. Kind of a checkered board formation where in the middle of the squares, that was the field itself. And on the border of the field, there were hard pathways where people walked. And you know as well as I do that if you walk on packed in dirt, it gets very, very hard. As hard as cement. And so when, they would, when he would sprinkle the seeds, some of the seeds would land on these hard pathways. So very hard that the seed could not get into the ground. That was where some seeds landed. And whenever the, seed, the seeds landed on those hard paths, the birds would come and they would devour it up. But then there's the shallow soil. We saw this in verses 5 and 6 where it says, talks about stony places. Some fell upon stony places. What is that talking about? Well, in the land of Israel, in some places, there would be what would look like fertile soil, but it was very thin, and it was over a layer of limestone. There's a lot of limestone there in Palestine. And there would be these plates of limestone with a thin layer of soil. Now, the farmer didn't know where the limestone was. So when he would throw seed on that certain area, the seeds would quickly be absorbed into that thin soil, and then they would sprout quicker than all the other seeds. In fact, the foliage would just grow up real big. And the heart of the farmer got very, very glad because he thought, this is going to be a great harvest. I mean, look how, look how this plant is sprouting up so quickly. But then what would happen? Well, because the, uh, of the, the shallowness of the soil... The seed really couldn't, the roots couldn't really get, get deep down into the soil. And so what would happen was the sun would come out, hot scorching sun, and pretty soon the foliage of that plant would wither and that plant was gone. Gone. Even in Palestine today, you could see a fully ripe plant shrivel in seconds when the hot sun comes out. Then there's the crowded soil. Look at verse 7. And some fell among thorns. And the thorns sprung up and choked them. This is a soil that looked good. It was deep. It was rich. It was fertile. The only, one problem is this soil was contaminated by weeds. Those fibrous weed roots hidden in the ground. And they would choke the life out of the plant. The, the weeds were indigenous to that soil. So it was very easy for those weeds to grow up. The, the, the grain seeds were not indigenous. It was, it was harder for them to grow in that Soil And so the weeds being natural would basically choke out the seeds that were planted there in that soil. And then there was another soil. There was the fruitful soil. Look at verse 8. But another other fell among good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. And so Galilee was known for having rich, fertile soil. And here the soil is soft. It's deep. It's clean. And so on that ground, the seed would burst forth into life and bring a tremendous harvest. By the way, the average harvest would yield about 7.5-fold 
a good, a good crop would be tenfold. Here Jesus says, this would yield a hundredfold. That's a huge crop. Some 60, some 30. So he's talking about a tremendously flourishing crop. So what do we see here? We see four different kinds of soils in this parable that Jesus is giving. And again, this is very familiar to the people of Palestine, but he's going to teach them something that is very encouraging about the kingdom. Look at verse number 9, where he says, He who hath ears to hear, let them hear. If you can understand this, if you can hear this, if you can get this, if you have ears to hear, listen. So that's the information of the parable. But here's number two. Write down the interpretation of the parable. What's, what's Jesus talking about here? Look at verse 18. Hear ye, therefore, the parable of the sower. The, the you there is plural. That's all of you. It's like Jesus saying today, look, I want you to hear this parable. I want you to understand this parable. It's emphatic in the Greek. And he's speaking to us. He wants you to know this. Now, this is not hard because let me ask you, who do you think the sower in this parable represents? Who do you think it represents? I'm asking you. Jesus. That's right. He's, out, he's the one out sowing the seed. Look at verse 37. He answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is who? Son of man. It's Jesus. And by the way, by way of extension, this can apply to anyone who really is preaching the word or sharing the word. You're also a sower. Did you know that? Anyone who's out there preaching the word? Every Sunday morning when I'm up here, you know what I'm doing? I'm throwing seeds at you. I'm scattering the seed. Anyone who preaches here in this pulpit, Sunday school teachers, when you teach, you're scattering the seed. When you're out there sharing the gospel, you're scattering the seed. And so we see the sower there. But now the seed. Let me ask you a question. What do you think the seed represents? Again, this isn't hard. Look at verse 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom. Now, so what is that? That's the word of God. The word of the kingdom. The seed is the word of God. Just write down in your margin, Mark 4, 14. The sower soweth the word. Luke 8, 11, it's even clearer. The seed is the word. Anyone, again, preaching and teaching is sowing the word of God. You know, something interesting about seeds we can't, man can't create seeds. You know that? Do you realize if it wasn't for seeds, we would all starve to death? I mean, well, I say starve to death. I mean, we, we could all eat all the animals, but, you know, we would have any vegetables or fruit, right? I mean, the seed is what, uh, it, it gives life. God is the one who gave us seeds. Man can't synth synthesize a seed, I'm trying to say. Man can't create seeds. Only God does that. That reminds me about the Word of God. You know what? I'm not here to create a message for you. You understand that? I'm just giving you the seed right here. And this was God-given. I'm just giving you the seed of the Word of God. We're utterly dependent upon His Word. And so just like the world today is dependent upon seeds that God has given, we're dependent upon the Word of God. Now the soils. So the sower, we know is, anyone, is Jesus or anyone who's sharing the Word. The seed represents the Word. The soils. Who do the soils represent? Well, look at verse 19. Again, it's clear, I think. When anyone heareth the Word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catches away that which is sown in his what? Heart. Sown in his heart. So what do the soils represent? The heart. The heart of the hearer. Think about that. Now remember, what's, what, what is Jesus doing here? What question is he answering? How come there's not more people getting saved? How come there's not more people coming into the kingdom? What's the problem here? That's the question that he's answering. Why is Jesus having such opposition? Why are the disciples having such opposition? And by the way, they will get more opposition, and we will experience it. Why so relatively few results in the preaching of Jesus and the disciples and in ours today sometimes? Why are people rejecting the message? What's the problem? Problem's not the sower. I mean, I don't think the problem was with Jesus, do you? No. I don't think the problem's with the seed. 
I think this seed is pretty good, don't you? In fact, I'm so convinced on it, I'm not going to preach anything else other than this. Is that okay? I think this seed is effective. The problem is not the sower. And the problem is not the seed. What's the problem? The problem is the soil. That's the issue. And that's the point that Jesus is trying to make here. The gospel hasn't failed. And the preaching of the gospel hasn't failed. The word of God hasn't failed. It's the condition of the soil. A person's response to the gospel is dependent upon the condition of their heart. The condition of the soil. And again, I think Jesus is doing this to encourage his disciples. Because he doesn't want them taking all this on themselves. You know what, if I, if, I th if I thought that everything was dependent on me, I couldn't stay in ministry. That's too much. That's too much of a burden for me to bear. If I felt like it's all dependent on Jerry Harmon, if it is all dependent on Jerry Harmon, you people are in big trouble. But you know what, i got good news for you. It's not dependent on me. It's dependent on the Word of God, the seed, just preaching the seed, getting it out, and Jesus is telling the disciples, look, don't take all of this personal. Don't take it on yourself. Just remember this parable. And by the way, what, what does the wayside soil represent? What kind of heart does that represent? Look again at verse 19. And when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is the, the soil is too hard. And the birds are waiting to snatch up that seed falling on that hard soil. This is the hearer who is hard-hearted. They're unresponsive. They're indifferent. The word of God just hits this person. It just bounces off. And, and the birds come and they snatch away the seed. This is, again, the fulfillment of verse 12. He that hath not is going to be taken away from him. If you're not receiving the word, if your heart is too hard to receive what is being preached, then you're not going to absorb the word. And not only that, Satan's going to snatch away whatever you got. That's the point there. And so there's no brokenness. There's no conviction. There's no repentance on this hard heart. And I think here, in the immediate context, Jesus is describing the religious leaders of his day, the Jews of his day, who should have believed on him. We're glad you've joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever-Living Story a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached as you've just seen. Our Sunday morning service starts at 11 a.m., so you still have time to join us. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway, at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life and he wants you to live out every day of it for his ever living story.